Okay, Linda, we're deal dealing with difficult meetings. What, what difficult meeting situation have you run into and what's your solution? Ah, great. Do you want me to do both together or one? No, do and, one and then do okay, another. Okay. okay. Ah. Well, the first thing about a difficult meeting is uh, a member, and it gets even more complicated if you have more than one member of a meeting uh, having a certain kind of behavior in which they have something they want to talk about. They might even have, you know, cleared it or, or presented it to the, um, to the chairperson to try to include it on the agenda, and it had gotten declined, but they are intent on sneaking that conversation in anyway. And no matter what the topic on the agenda is, they will try to take it off track to what they want to talk about. So that it, it might be something that somebody, you know, they didn't want to have on the agenda or not having gone through the chair. They're just in a meeting and they've got something on their mind and every conversation is a redirect. They'll take it off track which leads to very low productivity as well as everybody around the table is a bit teed off with this person. Mostly never, you know, most board meeting etiquette says nobody wants to say anything. So if you, if you have a situation like that, there are a couple ways that I've um, thought about. I, one particularly has been effective, but it could be the chairperson basically having the courage to be willing to say, there is something you're redirecting here. What is that? And identify it, right? To say, you can't do that. Or that the meeting has some space in the meeting, actually a dedicated time of about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, where it's open board time. So if somebody knows that there's an avenue for being able to bring up what they want to talk about, that they might be able to be more disciplined to stay on track with the discussion at hand. What if you're not, what if the chair doesn't bother to deal with it, but you're at the meeting and you're getting furious by what's happening? Have you got a way of coping with it as a member that's effective? I would uh, raise a point of order with uh, the process of the meeting and just present it, not like, what the, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to come across as taking somebody's head off, but raising a point of order of saying, okay, I, you know, getting the attention of the chair and saying, um, you know, I just want to check in with our process here because we seem to be continually going off track and address it with the members. There's something that they actually do want to talk about and then get board alignment as to whether we can address that at another time. And Sherry bothered to mention from the chat room that she finds it even worse when others seem to think it's okay to keep uh, talking about the issue. Yes, yes. Then it becomes even, you know, there needs to be like at least, uh, what would you Kay, say, one profile of courage in the room? <laughs> Otherwise, you know, everybody's just going to go off in whichever way they're going to do it. I mean, it really takes somebody to be willing to interrupt it uh, or to address it from the, the meeting, the meetings process to say, listen, this is not effective after the fact and say, how are we going to address this? Leave it to the group to how we're going to address it. Are you clear? <laughs> you really thought this was productive? No, but, yeah, but build it into the process in the future. And John comments that uh, he says he doesn't understand why it's okay not to challenge uh, a, a, appropriate, but what he means is inappropriate. Uh, oh, inappropriately? Well, yeah. Uh, and you had another one, Linda. Yeah. I did have another one. The other one, uh, well, that one was uh, side trackers. Uh, the other one was uh, if a meeting is not needed at all. So uh, there's two, two different uh, scenarios I want to present about this. One, it could be regulatory, where there's a, there is a group who has to meet and uh, they're in bylaws or from a regulatory agency that they have to meet X number of times during the course of the year. And they've determined that to spend two hours or so on something or try to take a piece of information, and stretch it out, but they find that it's not relevant, you know, it's not needed for them to have a meeting, is that they could look at, uh, one solution is that they could look at what would constitute a meeting. Is it a phone call? Is it, could they convene a conference call versus then having a physical meeting? But some way that they have control over the agenda and the discussions and yet still be able to meet the regulatory requirement. Yeah, that's one, one 
one aspect. The other aspect is uh, this actually recently happened to me um, just last week in which there's a, a committee and where we have regular calls. It's a, you know, wanting to keep this committee's work on task and going. Uh, and we ended up having, okay, we need to set the next meeting and we set the next call and we got on the call and very quickly in, we realized that after our initial update, we did not have to keep the 45 minute call. I mean, we didn't have to fill it up. Right. But it took something to actually recognize the situation and then say, you know, we don't have to go 45 minutes. It's amazing for human beings in a meeting. It's a 45 minute meeting. They got to fill it up and that we really didn't have to fill it up. We could actually complete this. Is there anything else that needed to get said? And it got done in 20. Uh, but it does, that does take someone being able to uh, be aware of. And sometimes it's just the awareness of at the beginning, what's our agenda? How long do we really need for this? And be willing to, I think if there's a willingness of being able to end it early. Um, uh, there was another, uh, I had another thought regarding, um, oh, oh, the other is that once you, uh, at the end of a meeting is what's the agenda for the next meeting? So you get a good sense about how long that meeting might be. Sometimes the conversations are shorter, but I think it's mostly awareness that do we really need to spend this time and you don't have to. So. And uh, Sherry does uh, say, do you have any thoughts about publicly elected boards who must meet physically and don't have a full agenda? Do you want to mm. comment on that, Linda? Well, um, Obviously, if it's a public, I mean, there might be, um, uh, they may want to say, so we have to meet, we're doing whatever it takes to have to come together. I mean, I think it's, it's first, it's being, um, uh, getting the what so about it, being willing to say, we don't have an agenda to fill this time. How might we use the other time constructively? Maybe it's uh, um, uh, creating it as a constituent in input session or a feedback session, but how, it, while it's not immediately on the agenda, but we have to meet and what would make it worthwhile for us and what else could we do constructively. Now, what I'd like to do is bring Sherry Jennings in. Linda, thank you very much. Could you uh, mute your microphone and uh, turn off your camera? And Sherry, if you would uh, uh, do the opposite. <laughs> hey, Sherry. Hey, you got, a, you got a you got a a, a difficult meeting situation for us. Um, yeah, and it's what happens when the agenda is uh, not is hijacked, and and if there's a set agenda and and no one seems to be sticking to what is on the agenda. It's somewhat similar to what Linda was talking about, but <clears throat> in this case. <clears throat> the chair needs to have some way of talking about and thinking through, um, you know, what kind of space and time do we have here? And can, can we really, with a priority set of items, which is what an agenda is, um, go and often talk about something at length that we didn't really schedule the time for? And there are some techniques for that that chairs need to be aware of and they need to be thinking about it ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a chair who's done a really good job of, of working with these kinds of things. And he tends to put more controversial items on the agenda first so that uh, there's enough time to deal with those things and the things that are going to be wrapped up rather quickly, um, he can put at the end so he can kind of move those along very quickly if, if need be. But, but the other point about that is, is if it looks like things are getting to, um, they're not getting to resolution or it's not, e it's not gonna be an easy answer for, for the board to come to, um, he, he'll say, okay, we're about out of time for this, this uh, conversation, it's been a good dialogue, but we now need to move this conversation either offline, off the agenda, um, and, and continue it, uh, it either in email or in a video conference um, or you know we need to move it to the next meeting and so we have time to do some homework in the interim 
Um, those are some of the things that a chair can do without pushing something off and, and making everyone feel like they haven't had adequate time for discussion. Um, just wrapping it up, saying, but we'll, we'll address this at, a, at, a, at another meeting or in a, in a different session, in a work session. And, uh, and uh, Linda is saying, well, what happens when members want to talk further anyway? Um, you just, the chair just has to exercise the discipline to cut it off and just say, I'm sorry, we can't. I, you know, they're, they're, <laughs> it's really interesting because I saw um, one group handle this in a way, and, and it was the same situation where there was an issue that was brought up by someone that was not on the agenda. There wasn't enough time to talk about it. Um, others seemed very interested and very keen to talk about it. Um, but she had prearranged with a board member to use Robert's rules. And in Robert's rules, you can table something. Um, there's a problem with that in my observation of this and how it went, is that uh, it really felt like that person was being cut off and the rest of the people were being cut off. And when you table something in Robert's rules, it really feels like you've killed it, right? That it's done. I mean, it, no one really understands Robert's rules because it's way too complicated. So I, my preference is really for the chair to, to, to take control of the situation and say, this is a really interesting topic. It's something we really need to spend some time on, but it's not time sensitive. We don't need to deal with it today. Let's, let's give ourselves some time to really think this through and put it on a different different agenda, different time frame. I think you're um, right about that. And if a group is going to be using Robert's rules, at least the chair needs to understand how the rules work. And my experience is when somebody brings up a, a situation such as tabling or postponing to a different time, or uh, even choosing not to consider a topic that, that's just come in uh, onto the table, which is probably the most brutal of all the uh, rules in Robert's Rules of Order, it's important for the chair when that arises, when a member does that and has the right to do that, to take the time to explain to the group what has happened, what rule is being invoked, and what their options are at that time. So I find that, that when somebody is using Robert's Rules of Order, part of the jo job of the chair is not to assume that everybody in the room has their own copy of Robert's Rules of Order and has studied it, but to tell them what their options are at that time and what's going to happen as a result. And uh, usually that gets over the issue. People say, yeah, well, let's table that. And we understand that we're, to raise it from the table, that's going to take a motion. And, uh, I, and, and I'm prepared to make that motion at the next, week, uh, next meeting. Yes. So I find that works really well. Yes, that's a good point. And, and Linda brings up uh, setting up proto protocol ahead of time, agreement on how unfinished conversations will be handled. And that's, that's a really good point. I mean, the, again, the chair has a job. <laughs> And the job is to understand how to either invoke and use Robert's rules or establish some meeting protocol for dealing with these situations that come up. And there, we identified them very quickly in about five minutes. What are some things that happen? It's very easy for a chair to become educated on how to, how to deal with those things. And um, you've got to have the will to do it as the chair and, and set and I think it, it, it increases the respect of the chair and the, and the respect of the chair's role um, if that person exer exercises some, some discipline. Um, so we need to probably wrap up so John can get on. I can see that. I'd like to thank both Sherry and Linda for joining me today and John, uh, who is in our chat field, and uh, for everybody's comments. And for the rest of us, we're going to... Uh, reconvene momentarily infuse. Thank you very much. Thank you.